first one, we'll be talking about caching. Now we all know about caching. It helps reduce latency from the web server and also to serve the users with their content faster. Now we know that browsers, for example, they do caching, but that's not the kind of caching we're talking about today. What we are talking about are servers that also function as caching mechanism. Now let's see a few forms of this kind of caching mechanism. And for that, you see Java here, she will be our end user. That's the web server, and in the middle, that's a caching mechanism serving this web server, okay? So the first form of a caching mechanism is CDN, okay? Content Delivery Network, that's a distributed network of proxies all over the world. They cache the application's content, and usually the group of proxies that is closest physically to the, server, to the end user, which will be the one who will serve him with his content. Now another example, another form of caching, caching mechanism, is a load balancer. A load balancer, its main purpose, we all know, is to balance the traffic between more than one server. But it can also cache some of the application's content. And one last uh, example is simply a reverse proxy, okay? Just the front end of the application, which can also uh, cache, the request, cache the content that is sent uh, from the web server to the user. Okay, so we all know about this. Let's see a simp uh, a pro how the process of caching looks like. So let's say that Java here wants to access this static file, stylesheet.css. This is an actual file on a web server. Let's see the process of it. So at first, the request arrives at the caching mechanism. Now the caching mechanism is not yet familiar with this file, okay? So it asks the web server to send it to him. Now the web server just sends this file to the caching mechanism, and now the caching mechanism has to decide whether this file should be cached or not. So in order to do that, it has some configuration that someone configured on it. So let's say that the configuration of this caching mechanism is to cache all static files no matter what, because no sensitive or private content con could reside inside static files like stylesheet, JavaScript, and most of the times, images, okay, sometimes. Uh, so now when the file arrives at the caching mechanism, the caching mechanism has to decide what type of file this is. So it looks at the end of the URL, and according to the end of it, to its extension, which is now CSS, it decides that this is a static file and I should cache it. So this file is now cached on the caching mechanism. Now this file is sent to the user's browser, okay? So the next time any user, this one or another one, will try to access this file, the request will arrive at the caching mechanism, and now the caching mechanism is already familiar with this file, right? So we'll just send it back straight to the client without asking it from the web server. Now that's a standard process of caching, and that was the first baseline out of two. Let's move on to the next. In the next baseline, the second one, we'll be talking about server's reactions. Now the first time I heard of it was in two blogs I read about the RPO vulnerability, Relative Path Override Attack. It was the Spanner and XSS Jigsaw. So let's say that this is an actual uh, URL of a web application. There is account.php page, but we don't access this uh, URL, but this URL. We add a slash and then a name of a non-existent file with any extension. So let's see what happens now. So if we try to access this URL, our client, our browser, will send this request as is. It won't be changed. This will arrive, this will arrive at the web server. What's more interesting to look at is how the web server interprets this request. And in certain cases, and not just a few, and we're gonna get to concrete examples as the, con as the talk continues, the web server will return a 200 OK HTTP response, meaning this URL stays the same with the content of the user's account page. This will be just sent to the user's client. Okay, so I know it's a bit weird and you're gonna see some more examples. So we know that for this weird URL, the content of account for each PHP will be sent from the web server to the client. But what about the HTTP response headers? Will they match the dynamic PHP file or the non-existent CSS file? So as the content, the HTTP response header will also match the dynamic PHP file. You can see an example here for the same URL on a similar browser, uh, web server, sorry. You can see that the file returned from the web server with a no cache directive matching a dynamic private PHP page. And at the bottom you can see the content type which is text HTML and not 
text CSS, okay? So we've covered the two important baseline, now we can get down to business. Let's talk about the attack and understand how web cache deception works. So here on the right, you can see a web server hosting the web application of Java's bank. Java is my dog, right? You remember that. Okay, so in the middle you can see a caching mechanism serving this web server, and this caching mechanism is configured to, ca to, to cache all static files. Now, one thing you didn't know about Java here is that Java has a red-haired evil twin, and she's also a hacker, by the way. So one day, this evil twin approaches Java, and she says, Waff. Now, she's not talking about web application firewalls, okay? Dogs, <laughs> dogs don't do that, they just dogs. But what it, what it means in English, let me translate this for you, is, hey Java, can you please access the URL of your bank account, okay, bank.com slash account.do slash a name of a non-existent file with a static extension, stylesheet.css. Now Java is an aware user, okay? She doesn't click any link she receives on Facebook. We, th we taught her well, okay? So she takes a good look at this URL and it doesn't look suspicious at all, right? This is domain, the domain of her bank account and it doesn't contain any, some kind of malicious code, right? It looks totally legit, so she decides to access this link. And let's see what happens now. So Java accesses this link and a request is sent and arrives to the caching mechanism at first, right? So the caching mechanism is not familiar with this file. So we just send this request to the web server. Now the web server, as we just talked about, uh, returns a 200 OK response, meaning the URL stays the same with the content of Java's bank account, with their own private and sensitive content. Now this is sent back to the caching mechanism. And that's the most interesting part of the web cache deception attack, because now the caching mechanism has to decide whether to cache this file or not. So it looks at the end of the URL, it sees a static extension, and as I said, it's configured to cache all static files, okay? So, since it's a CSS file, while well, it it's not really a CSS, a CSS file, the caching mechanism just caches this file with Java's private and sensitive content, okay, of our bank account. So now this page is cached, and is sent to Java's browser, but that's not interesting at all. What's really interesting is that now the evil twin can just access this URL on her own without being authenticated to the website. The caching mechanism receives this request and is now familiar with this file, right? He just cached it. So we just sent it back without asking it from the web server back to the evil twin's browser. Now the evil twin just received a copy of a cached file containing the private content of Java's bank account. It's that simple. And this is how the attack works. Now this is bad, but it could get even worse than that. Let's say that the HTML content contains some CSRF tokens. So now the evil twin can use it in order to attack Java with CSRF. It could get even worse than that. In two web applications that are found to be vulnerable, there's no good reason for that, okay? But the HTML content of their web application contains the user's session ID. So in this case, the evil twin can just take the session ID from the HTML content and take complete control over the user's account. Okay, so now we know how the web cache deception attack works. So let's see a demo of, uh, let's see a demo web application and understand how we can detect over a web application whether it is vulnerable or not. Okay, so I think the video is not uh, working, so let me, let me put it on here. Yeah, it's right here. Oh, have it here, okay. Okay, so this is a web application which is hosted on an Apache web server and it is also served by the Cloudflare CDN for caching. It's open on the left on a Chrome browser and on the right on Firefox. We are now logged out, okay? Um, now there is a private page in the application called private.php. Each user that accesses this page while logged in can see his own private content. So if we try to access it now, obviously we will be redirected back to the login page, okay? You can see it in both browsers. Now if we try to access a triggering URL, meaning we'll take the content, the, the URL, sorry, of the private.php page, and we'll add slash and a name of a non-existent file with a static extension, logo.png, we are redirected to the login page also because this page doesn't exist yet, okay? So net, now let's log in with the admin account to the web application on the Chrome browser. 
Okay, now you can see the content of the admin user, okay? That's his own private content. Now let's log in while we are logged in to the triggering URL, meaning we take the URL, we add a slash log.png. Well, PNG, that's the name of a static file, okay? That's a ext static extension. Now the page is cached on Cloudflare. So if we take this triggering URL and access it on another, way, uh, on another browser or another device, we just easily expose the, the content of the private, of the private content of the admin user. It's that simple. 